Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, part two of the $1,500 Buick build with the i7-8700 GTX 1070 Ti, the Gigabyte Gaming 5 Z370 motherboard, and various other parts. Part one of this video will be linked down in the video description below, but this is basically a summary of the build process. I'm gonna show you some pictures of that. I also have a couple of basic benchmark tests and stress testing A to 64 temps with this 120 millimeter liquid cooler. In today's video, I'm gonna talk about the experience of building in this case, what I would do differently if I had it to do again, and my thoughts on alternatives of this. Now, I did discuss the alternatives a bit in the first video, but since playing around with this, I have a few more thoughts in that department. First, let me say, if you're new to my channel, welcome, thank you for joining. If you are a regular longtime viewer, welcome back, and you will notice this does not follow my normal plan of build video series where I do four, five, six, sometimes seven videos on a computer with great detail in every regard. The first video was pretty long and I put a lot into it, but this is actually gonna be the second and last video on this computer. I'm not doing the actual video of the build. I'll show you some pictures of it. I'm gonna show you some uh, stress testing and a few other things here in a minute, but I have quite a few build videos to get done in the next 30 days or so. So this is an abbreviated build. I just did an i7-8700K. This isn't that far off other than cooler size and case choice. In terms of quality of motherboard, in terms of quality of components, it's pretty similar overall, except for the case, cooler, and power supply. Those scaled back because we have a non-K chip and there's just no need to spend a lot of money on them if you're not gonna go for five gigahertz. First, I wanna talk about the build process itself, my thoughts of this case after putting a system in it, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the questions and comments that were beneath the first video. I wanna address some of the uh, component choices because perhaps the first video didn't fully explain it or perhaps some people need to hear it phrased differently in terms of my point of view. As I said in the first video, custom PCs are custom. There's nothing wrong with you changing stuff in a build like this to suit your own personal preferences or desires. Ryzen 5 1600, i5 8600K, I completely understand. It's your machine, build it your way. You can see I now have the system powered on. It is running, although it's not connected to anything at the moment. You can see the one red LED fan in the front. I mentioned before there's room at the bottom for a second one, there is. Somebody made the comment that rather than take the drive cage out, you can take the front panel off. That's actually true. I didn't actually think about that. That's a much easier way to go about. So if you wanna put a fan on, this front panel does come off. You can see there is a red LED light strip up here. I actually was not aware of that one until I turned it on. When it came on, I was like, oh, that's actually pretty cool. So you can see what it looks like in the front. Now these are red LEDs, it's not RGB, so you can't change the color without changing the fan. It is not overly bright. I'll turn the lights down in just a second so you can see what it looks like, but it's a muted color, at least in the bright light, so it's not glaring, but it adds a nice touch to the system. I've now turned the lights out so that you can see what it looks like in the dark. Now it is pretty dark in here and you may notice it is not overly bright. Now some of that is my camera, but the reality is if you're concerned about the red LEDs being this bright garish uh, light that's just gonna be very distracting, it's not, they're muted. So if you're putting this under your desk or even next to your computer, it's not gonna be this huge bright light shining in your eyes or otherwise causing a distraction. Now you might want such a thing, but just be aware it's relatively dim. And so you're not gonna have some huge bright light underneath your desk. Regarding the actual build of the computer and the installation of all the parts, let me offer you a couple of thoughts. In the individual case review I did of this Spec 2 case from Corsair, I commented that the two 120 millimeter fan mounts on top really wouldn't allow the installation of a 240 millimeter radiator. It would be really tight and to check your motherboard. Yeah, that's not gonna work. I mean, yes, in theory, there might be a couple of motherboards that would allow that up there. There is no room in the top of this case. Fans only on the top. I've seen several people comment that you could mod the case to put a 240 millimeter in the front. Yeah, I suppose. If you want that, this is the wrong case. Seriously, I said it before, I'll say it again. Get a bigger case if you want that large of a cooler. Likewise, this case is not designed for Dark Rock Pro 3s and uh, not to a D15. So if you want those, again, bigger case. But for a 120 millimeter cooler, that went in very, very easily. There was no problem installing the 120 millimeter cooler in here. 
The only thought is the fan needs to be installed in the back rather than the front. In other words, it needs to be a pull rather than a push, pushing the air out the back. And the reason is because of the shape of the back of the case, the radiator itself is too large and wouldn't fit where the rear 120 millimeter mount is. The fan fits there and then the radiator fits it on it just fine. I'll show you a picture of that here. And essentially what I'll say is that it fits extremely snugly but I did not have a problem with the plastic above the IO shield on this motherboard interfering with the fan or the radiator. They were really close, but it was not a problem. Regarding cable management, this large bulge here does in fact give plenty of room for the ATX power cable and other items behind the case. This, there really is not a problem with managing cables for what you'll fit into this case. So that is okay. Be aware that while there is a hole up at the top to route the eight pin CPU power connector, the motherboard blocks it where it's installed, so it's completely pointless. The eight pin CPU power cable has to be run in the front. Now, thankfully it's not too tall of a case, so I was able to run it up the side of the edge of the motherboard and up across the top. It's just a very, very tight fit. For the rest of the cables, there's ways to run them down the side channeling and to get them down to the bottom. Even with a full size ATX motherboard, I did not find cable management to be a problem. Be aware, as you'll see from some pictures I'm gonna show you here, it's messy at the bottom and there's no power uh, supply shield. There's nothing covering all these cables. So it's not the prettiest build and there's just no place to put all those spare cables for the power supply and there's nothing to cover them. $60 case, less than $50 power supply, it is what it is. So if a beauty build with gorgeous cable management is your goal, yeah, this definitely won't do it. If you're okay to just stuff your cables down next to the power supply on the bottom of your case, it actually works just fine, even with a full-size ATX board. Likewise, I installed a two and a half inch SSD as well as a three and a half inch hard drive. Routing the power and data cables for those, not a problem. Very easy to install, toolless for both of them. So that went in quick and easy. I am pleased to report the system booted the first time without a problem. I did go into the BIOS and update the BIOS before installing Windows. This board does have both Meltdown and Spectre protection, Meltdown mostly being in Windows, but I did check with the Inspector tool and after installing the latest BIOS, yes, it is Spectre protected. So no problem there. In terms of the BIOS itself, it's fully featured and there's tons of options in there, but since we have a non-K chip, there's a limit to what you can do. Setting the memory to DDR4-2400 was of course not a problem with the XMP profile. If you buy faster RAM, it will of course run faster because it's a Z-series board. But overclocking the CPU is going to be very limited because again, not a K chip. Can you use multi-core enhancement? Yes, you can but unfortunately it doesn't do anything. I played around with the various overclocking settings. I went in to manually turn on turbo boost. I set all the ratios to 46, even manually. I turned on multi-core enhancement. I set the ratio to 46, nothing. I did multiple reboots and multiple uh, configuration changes in the BIOS. It would not run all six cores at 4.6 gigahertz, no matter what I did. So there are some boards that may do it. This one doesn't. 4.3 on all the cores is all you're going to get, unfortunately, at least with this board and this CPU. If this were an i7-8700K, then multi-core enhancement would let it run at 4.7 gigahertz on all the cores. Is a jump from 4.3 to 4.7 worth the 50-ish dollar price difference between the K and the non-K chip? That's a personal decision. However, I will note that at 4.7 gigahertz, you're really gonna be pushing the limits of a 120 millimeter liquid cooler. Which brings up the question, at full A to 64 stress testing, how hot does the CPU get on average with this 120 millimeter cooler at 4.3 gigahertz on all the cores? Well, that's what you're looking at right now. I ran this for over 30 minutes to make sure the CPU was fully warm, everything was fully spun up. And as you can see here, the averages are absolutely trivial in the 50s. Yes, it a temporarily spiked higher, sometimes into the 70s, but seriously, you are looking at temps that are so far below this chip's max operating temperatures, you will never have a temperature issue on the CPU. Now, to be completely fair, a 120 millimeter liquid cooler is unnecessary for this. A Hyper 212 Evo or something similar in the 20 to $30 price range would be enough. But the liquid cooler looks nice and of course it certainly removes any temp issues. And for what it's worth, I tested this system in a 72 degree Fahrenheit room. If you don't have air conditioning, if you have a hotter environment than I do, 
then maybe this is beneficial to you in terms of keeping your CPU cool. One note regarding noise, under A to 64 stress testing, all the various fans in the system do get not loud, but noisy, audible, I should say. It's not terrible. If the computer was under the desk, it wouldn't bother me too much. If it was on top of the desk, I would change the fans for whatever that's worth. Now, outside of A to 64 stress testing, which by the way, does put more of a load on your system than you normally see, just launching Grand Theft Auto V, it's not gonna be loud. But if you're doing say video encoding or 3D animation work where it runs at full power continuously, yeah, as built, this does get a bit noisy. But frankly, if you're doing that workload, A, you should probably have a better case with larger fans and B, you should probably be on the high-end platform anyway. I'm now gonna put up a couple of benchmarks. Cinebench R15, for example, you can see that here. I'm also gonna show you 7-Zip, the file compression decompression benchmark, as well as CPU bench. There's not a bunch of game benchmarks or whatnot here because the reality is I've done all of those. I've done the GTX 1070 Ti. I've done the i7 8700 and 8700K previously on my channel. So redoing those tests doesn't accomplish anything. The performance does not change just because the motherboard or brand of video card changes. Now, as far as this build, would I do anything differently or would I suggest doing anything differently? Yes, I would. The first change as built, this motherboard is overkill for this CPU to be completely honest with you. It's a 300R CPU, it's a 200R motherboard with great overclocking features and power delivery that is wasted on a non-K chip. So going down to perhaps the ultra gaming for 30 or $40 less, or perhaps going even lower, would I put the $99 board from Gigabyte on this CPU? Sure, why not? It's absolutely designed for it. It's a locked CPU, it'll run just fine on it. If you don't like the features of that board, they have several in between at 115, 135, 150, and so on. As you step up to each of those price points, you get better built-in audio chips, you get a better LAN chip. The very cheap boards have Realtek 800 series audio, Realtek LAN chips, etc. And then you move up to the ALC 1220 and Intel Gigabit LAN and whatnot as you move up that spectrum. Now, this is a gorgeous board with gorgeous RGB and Wi-Fi and wonderful features and three M.2 slots, most of which will never get used in the system. So it's overkill, but it looks really nice. And hey, if you just want a nice board, then by all means. The other change is the CPU and the motherboard choice itself. I could make an argument either way, Ryzen 5 1600 on a B350 board for $100 or this. It is really tempting to give you an absolute statement, buy this or buy Ryzen. This is sort of right in the middle. A GTX 1070 Ti is on the margin of value between a Ryzen 5 1600 and an i7 8700. Make no mistake about it, both CPUs are six cores, 12 threads, but this is undeniably faster. Not just faster in benchmarks, but I can feel the difference when using it. I've now built enough of these. I've built a Ryzen 5 1600 and a 1600X as full builds on my channel and done lots of benchmarking on them. I have an 8700K I use full time for my Twitch streaming downstairs. I've spent enough time with these to tell you just using them, I can see and feel the difference. However, this costs more. How much? about $200 all up for the non-K chip versus a Ryzen 5 1600. That 200 difference comes in in the motherboard, the cooler, and the CPU. You don't need a cooler with the Ryzen 5 1600, run it at 3.7 gigahertz on the included RaySpire cooler, get a $99 motherboard, and you're good to go. Now, of course, you can buy a cheaper motherboard for this, but still, the Ryzen is less expensive, but it's not as fast. Does it matter? Yes and no. The truth of the matter is you notice the difference when you have the machine side by side. When you have as many computers as I do, I, I start to pick out where you can sense and feel the difference and where you can't. But I still play on an i5-4460 downstairs. I retired the 2400 with my kids with a GTX 1050 when I play World of Warships. And frankly, once you're in the game, you really, it doesn't matter. Yes, there's a difference, but not much of one. So that's a big, long rambling explanation of, yes, this is faster, but whether it matters is a big, huge fat, it depends. Are you okay to spend more to get more? I, I said it in the first video and it's kind of cliche, pay more, get more. Do you have the money? Then spend it because you'll grow into it. This CPU will last longer than a Ryzen 5 1600 will because it has more performance. It will be some longer period of time in the future before you will feel the need to upgrade when the performance no longer cuts it. 
On the flip side, Ryzen has longer support. You could buy the Ryzen 5 1600 today, and then two or three years from now, upgrade to Ryzen 3 or possibly even Ryzen 4 and potentially keep your motherboard. Well, or so they promise. We've already seen with the Ryzen APUs, motherboard support is kind of hit and miss, but BIOS and driver fixes may address that. It's always challenging promising future CPU support in existing boards because those CPUs haven't been invented yet, but that's the promise with Ryzen. Two years from now, if you want to upgrade the CPU, you'll be replacing the board, no question. So with that big long explanation out of the way, it very much depends upon your budget. I will say this, if you're not going with at least a GTX 1070, if you're going with say a GTX 1060 or 1050 or RX 570 or 580, a Ryzen 5 1600 is fine, unless you plan to upgrade your graphics card in the summer of 2018 when the next gen comes out. A i7-8700 is a bit wasted, on a 200R graphics card. I don't think that makes any sense. But if you're spending $500 in your graphics card, then I think an i7-8700 makes sense. So to some extent, which one you buy depends upon what you're putting around it. If you're building a 1500R machine, sure, i7, it's very nice. Building a 1000R machine, Ryzen 5 1600 makes a lot more sense. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge red button directly below. Questions and comments in the comment section. I'm sure there'll be more than a few. And as always, check out the video description. Links to Amazon and Newegg for all the stuff I've talked about here. As always, those are affiliate links. They do support the channel. Please consider using those if you are able to. I would greatly appreciate it. You can also follow me on Twitch and Twitter down there. And if you're able to support me on Patreon, I would greatly appreciate it. In this build, the only two parts provided to me by any of these companies, the liquid cooler was provided by Cooler Master and the power supply was provided by Corsair. The motherboard, the case, the CPU, the RAM was all purchased by me. So while I do get sent samples of things, less than you might think, your support on Patreon really does make a difference. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video.